From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in London and I've done my last commentary game of the English summer, working now on the end of season awards and lunch for the Cricket Writers Club, which is always a good end of season bash. And of course, waiting to see exactly what will happen with the men's and women's ashes, arguably, I think, more question marks over the conditions for the men traveling out to Australia. But before that, there's a T20 World Cup, of course, as well. So planes are ready for the departure for the England men on their way to that as well. Hi, it's Jim Maxwell in lovely lockdown Sydney. There's a spike here and there, so you never know what's going to happen next in uh, the various republics, otherwise known as the states under the Commonwealth of Australia. But I can tell you, New South Wales and Victoria are going to start playing Sheffield Shield in two weeks. After they've done their quarantine in South Australia, they'll be stuck there for two months. So this is the sort of up and down and roundabout. And, uh, of course, there's a test match between the Australian women in India. And let's hope it's as exciting as the uh, the one day as of me. And I'm Sunil Gupta for All India Radio in New Delhi. And I certainly hope that the women's test match will be as exciting as the one that was there in England, India women versus England women. But right now, the public debate is slowly turning towards possible changes in the Indian team. You mentioned the T20 Ali uh, World Cup. It's coming up and uh, people are talking about two or three people who might be in the hot seat because uh, they haven't really performed at the IPL. And I dare say there are a few other names that are being tossed up in the air. So it's all fun and games really right now with the IPL and the World T20 to follow. Yeah, we'll be following all of that closely on Stumped. Of course, uh, good to have you, Sunil and Jim, as well. Shortly, we're going to hear from the new president of the MCC, the Marleybone Cricket Club, Claire Connor. But I just want to start, first of all, this week, talking about the England all-rounder Moeen Ali retiring from Test Cricket because we heard that he is going to continue to play white ball international cricket. But in tests, well, he retires with a record that says 2,914 runs and 195 wickets in 64 matches, having made his debut against Sri Lanka in 2014. He retires at the age of 34, kind of leaving us feeling as if the story hasn't quite finished. It's been a bubbling over for a bit of time. Not, not too long, to be honest with you. I mean... Um, I was still keen to play and do well and, and stuff like that. But I just, I think the break between 2019 when I got dropped and to when I played recently in India where I had three games, I think it was too long to spend with you. And I think my mindset had changed a bit. And I just find it really difficult to really focus on while playing the red ball. I find it really long. Um, it's, it's a great, obviously, um, format of the game when you're in it. I just find it very difficult to really get into it. And it's a shame, but um, I feel like I'm very content and very happy with my decision. So that's Moeen Ali. Jim, you know, he was saying there that his mindset changed when he had that break in 2019 and he then found it hard to concentrate. Do you think he's made the right decision to step back from test? And, and what are your memories of watching him play? Well, my memories are uh, not as strong as they would have been watching him play in England, particularly against India uh, when he did so well in them previous series and on a number of other occasions. The fact is he never acquitted himself as well as he he would have liked to against Australia in test cricket. Uh, His bowling was marginal at best when he played here in the last Ashes series. I think he took five wickets and 115. Yeah, look, he's a fine all-round cricketer. And at this stage of his career, the white ball stuff is the way for him to go. What really sort of concerned me, though, I think, in terms of the like the bigger picture was what you said about struggling to get into the zone for test cricket and concentrate for long periods. It made me just think, well, how many others might find that in the fullness of time if they play more and more white ball cricket and the 100 being in the main part of the English summer as well with test matches sort of squeezed either side. You know, test cricket really will be in trouble if there are players who actually feel that they are not equipped to play it. Sunil, though... I want to talk to you about India's women. Well, 
They had a remarkable win over Australia, didn't they? Ultimately, finally breaking Australia's long run of wins in ODIs, a 26-match winning streak. Keen to hear what coverage that victory got in India, but also how the increasing calls for a women's IPL are being heard. We've been talking about it for so long on Stumped. Is it gaining any realistic traction? Yeah, well, a couple of things. Um, I think the ODI series is very well covered. It was live on television and satellite television. Got very good uh, coverage in the newspapers, uh, especially that second game, which went to the wire and that contentious uh, no ball. Coming to the IPL or a women's IPL, I think that's a completely different kettle of fish. Uh, there was, if you remember, a women's T20 challenge with uh, three teams that played on the cusp of the IPL before. But it really was on the fringe. I think the time will surely come. I think one of the key things is that if you must have at least six teams to, to make it a proper league. Just from predominantly local talent, I think it's a slightly difficult, uh, I mean, overreach right now. India has uh, so many leagues. You have the Indian Hockey League, you have the Indian Football League. Everybody's trying, you know, to get those uh, sports off the ground, but they really haven't caught on. Maybe we need a, an entrepreneur to set something up as a sort of rebel league, but then again, probably wouldn't get any permission of the players to play, but that might certainly get the BCCI moving, perhaps. From the BBC World Service, this is Stumped on All India Radio. Former England women's captain Claire Connor is this week taking up the prestigious role as president of the Marylebone Cricket Club. She picks up the mantle from former Sri Lanka men's captain Kumar Sangakkara. Now, the MCC is the club based at Lords that sports the famous egg and bacon colours. The club has considerable global influence in the game, does a lot of charity work as well, and remains guardians of the laws. Now, it's the first time in the club's 233-year history that a woman's been appointed to the role of president. It was only 22 two years ago that the club voted in favour of accepting women as members even. As well as taking up the honorary role, Connor will continue as the Managing Director of Women's Cricket at the ECB and Chair of the ICC Women's Cricket Committee. Well, Claire is a very busy woman, but I'm really glad she's found time to speak to us on Stumped. Claire, yeah, you were up anointed a little while ago, but do you still feel that significance of being the first woman in the role? Yeah, I do, Ali. I feel it really keenly. I've had a long time to prepare, I suppose, for, for this huge opportunity. It's such an honour. I've had a long time to, to let it sink in and to do some thinking and to, to talk to lots of people and, and get kind of some, some guidance and some insight. I think the timing is, is really lovely with where the game is at the moment, where particularly the women's game is on the back of a, a kind of landmark summer, really. And with 2022 being a bumpy year for, particularly for women's cricket with Ashes, World Cup defence and the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. And, and, and also just a really strong sense from the club, from, from members and from, from Guy Lavender as chief executive and his team, that it's an exciting place to be um, and that there's lots of plans afoot for the coming year um, as the club looks to keep modernising, keep being relevant to more people. Yeah, it's uh, really, really exciting. As you say, it's going to be a busy time, but one that I'm, uh, I'm determined to really kind of make the most of and cherish. So what aims and objectives have you set for yourself? Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think, I think, well, firstly, it's really difficult to know until you're in something what the scope is, um, it, you know, in terms of my possible impact or influence or, or support for the club. I think, you know, there's no doubt, though, that uh, kind of at the heart of my thinking and, and feeling about the opportunity is a real desire to work with the club to make it more inclusive and for women and girls to feel more part of this very, very special place. You know, I'm sitting here looking, looking over it and it's, uh, it's got, I think, such opportunity. It's, uh, as you've said, you've outlined, it's got such reach and such influence as a club. It, it is such a force for good. And I think with, with its relationship, with its foundation, I'm a trustee of that, the, the MCC Foundation, and with the amazing work it's done, particularly during the pandemic, the community team here, it's got such potential as a club to, to take cricket to more people. COVID permitting, there will be the chance, I hope, to travel. And I really hope, whether it's with the, with the club, with the MCC, or through the work of the foundation, with its incredible projects in Nepal, Lebanon, I really hope that I can be that ambassador for the club with some exciting overseas work as well. Yeah, uh, this is Sunil Gupta in New Delhi. First of all, congratulations on your appointment. So there's been some backlash uh, in certain parts of the media to the change in batting terminology from batsman to batter. Uh, have you been surprised at the reaction? Um, no, I haven't been surprised. You know, the, the keepers of that language 
in the main have been men who have been privileged in terms of their access to the game and their opportunities in the game. So, you know, everyone's entitled to their opinion, of course, but I think until you walk in the shoes of someone who, for whatever reason, hasn't felt welcomed or included or part of something, then I think it's it's very hard for, for people to understand and empathise and, and, and feel what that might be like. Language, as we know, is very powerful. The language, language of any um, environment, particularly language in sport, the symbols in our game, the language in our game, it shouldn't exclude anybody. You know, an eight-year-old girl unlike when I was an eight-year-old girl, actually, and all my experiences, all my playing experiences with, were with men and boys. But an eight-year-old girl now is in a very different place from, from when I was that age, you know, over 30 years ago. And that young girl now doesn't want to be a batsman. She doesn't want to be a policeman. She doesn't want to be a postman. She doesn't want to be a fireman. Why would she want to be anything that has got the word man in it? And so the backlash is coming from people who can't empathize with that position. So I don't, it isn't at all surprising. Uh, you know, I think it's a really good step that the MCC have done that. The MCC knew that there would be backlash to it, but the MCC took the decision knowing it was the right thing to do as, a, as another step forward for the game to be more welcoming of everybody. So it, it's prompted a debate as well, which is good. Um, it's good for people to try to put themselves in other people's shoes. You know, they still might not like it, but at least the debate is open. Um, and it's it's change in my mind in in absolutely the right direction um, for cricket to be a sport that everybody can see themselves in. Claire, the passion in your voice is absolutely clear. In terms of accessibility to the game, you mentioned Pakistan and the MCC took a team out in February of last year, and that was quite instrumental in signalling to the global cricketing world that Pakistan is a safe place to tour. Obviously, England has now pulled out its men and women from the tour scheduled for this October. What, when did you first learn about that? Were you involved as, because of course you are Managing Director of Women's Cricket at the ECB as well, were you involved in discussions around that? Yes, of course. Um, you know, ultimately in that role as Managing Director of Women's Cricket at the ECB, you know, it's a, it's a leadership position and you know, we as a leadership team, we have kind of collective responsibility for, for, for decisions across the game. So I was involved in, in, in a lot of, if not all, then the majority of those discussions, you know, as has been well, well documented and, and well debated. It's a, obviously a very disappointing outcome, particularly for the people of Pakistan and the players, male and female, and the fans who have been starved of, of cricket in their, in their country for such a long time. And especially given the huge progress, you know, I was in Pakistan last February and saw the PSL, the Pakistan Super League in action just before I went on to the T20 World Cup in Australia. Um, and to see the passion of, of a full, you know, a full stadium uh, of cricket lovers for domestic men's cricket was really humbling and inspiring. You know, so it's unbelievably disappointing for the progress that the game, the return of the game to Pakistan was making. Um, was it ultimately deemed unsafe? Because, of course, we heard from the British Com High Commissioner that the security advice had not changed. Look, it, it, the, the events that took place on that Friday, last Friday, just under a, a week ago now, with the kind of immediate withdrawal of the New Zealand, New Zealand men's cricket team, obviously heightened anxieties hugely. A decision had to be taken. The board, ultimately, the ECB board is responsible for taking that decision with the information in front of them at the time, and that's a, a mold coming from a multitude of sources, including the, the sentiment amongst the playing groups and the staff. I did, you know, the players say that they weren't consulted. Yeah, well, I look, I'm not going to get into the kind of the, how you might define consulted. There were lots of conversations with players, whether they were formal, minuted consultation meetings or whether they were informal conversations about the evolving situation during last weekend. And those conversations also were taking place with, um, with the PCA and TEP and EWPP, which is the women's equivalent of TEP. There was an urgency that, to the decision, particularly on the men's side with the T20 World Cup preparations and logistical, how it would affect logistics. And the board, the board took a strong decision that I think at the, at the time, absolutely at, that, at the time, was the right decision. 
And with your MCC hat on, how important for England women or any other women's team to get to Pakistan to have that visibility, in particular the men as well, of course, but the women were due to have such an impact. Absolutely. When we worked with the Pakistan, with Wazim Khan and the Pakistan Cricket Board back in January and realised that we could make this a joint England men's and women's tour with double header T20s um, on what was due to, you know, due to be the 13th and 14th of October and that, that we could then add on a women's ODI series. The excitement um, around that decision was really tangible. It carried huge significance. As you say, it was due to be a historic tour. England women have never been there before. And as you know, Ali, from, from many conversations in the past and the conversations you will have had with our play, our female players, they take their, their responsibility and their opportunities in the game really seriously in terms of trying to spread the game, strengthen the game. And I don't say that in any way in a patronising tone towards pa the Pakistan women's team. But our players know they have a, an unbelievable platform and, and they knew that to see international women's cricket and to, to give international women's cricket visibility in Pakistan was a, an amazing opportunity and responsibility and privilege. And to that, to that end, yeah, they, they, they're, they're disappointed that it's not happening right now. And, you know, I, I hope that we can reschedule those games. A final thought while we've got you here, Claire. Ashes, what is the, the latest from your perspective from the, the women's Ashes and indeed, I suppose the, the overall picture around conditions, what players might face. Yeah, well, look, we, we've, as has been, I think, spoken about this week, there's been really good progress on the men's ashes. You know, there's still quite a few I's to dot and T's to cross in terms of final kind of understanding of, of restrictions and, and quarantine and, and all of that um, and the kind of interstate challenges. Uh, but I think we're making really good progress. Um, so hopefully good progress can continue. Um, and we can see, a, you know, a, as, as full as possible. I know there's obvious challenges with Perth, but as full as possible, a, a, an England men's ashes uh, schedule. Um, and that, that can pave the way for a, a hopefully a, a kind of transition into the women's ashes in the new year. Claire Connor, the incoming president of the MCC, taking up her role this week. Well, that's it for this week's Stumped here on All India Radio. Don't forget you can find all of our content on Twitter. We're at BBC WS Sport and use the hashtag BBC Stumped. Thanks to Sunil Gupta and Jim Maxwell and to you all for listening. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Stumped is a BBC Sport production for the BBC World Service in association with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and All India Radio.